Not all childhood trauma comes in the form of neglect or physical abuse. One of the most insidious forms of trauma is when parents brainwash children to override their own common sense, to ignore what their eyes and ears tell them and live in fear and live under the constant threat of ostracization for breaking an impossible set of rules. My letter today is from a woman I'll call Ashley, and she writes, Dear Anna, I feel like there's finally hope for me and real he healing uh, in some major areas, and I would greatly appreciate your feedback. Tough love is welcome. <laughs> My main questions are these. How do I stop having flashbacks about past trauma? How do I get motivated to work on my marriage after trying so many things? How do you know whether it's time to walk away or keep trying? Hmm, <laughs> I'm almost hearing the answer in the question. Here is a brief background of my story. I'm 43 years old, married 20 years, no children. And up until watching your videos, I thought CPTSD is only for people with severe trauma, like sexual abuse, extreme neglect, and physical abuse. While none of those things happened to me, I grew up in a house with a mother who had a very short temper. My father was avoidant and spent all his time in his den or behind a book. He didn't talk much and he allowed my mom to run the house. She was a screamer and a door slammer. And things got physical several times. Are you talking about mom and dad getting physical? Because that's physical, that's physical abuse, which you think you didn't have. All right, even watching it is abuse, you know. The police came over when I was around 12 because I showed up at school with bruises. Okay, it was at you. Darling, you had physical abuse. This is very interesting that you think you didn't count as being physically abused. Okay. I turned to sugary food to self-comfort, struggled with my weight my entire life, and I, keep, and I still have a constant battle keeping up my will to live. Um, yeah, what you're describing is feelings people have when they've been abused. Yeah. All right. I was born into a religious cult. Okay. Huh. Obviously, I didn't know I was in a cult until I started doing independent research in 2015. My dad got disconnected from the religion just before I was born, and my mom was a zealot for the group until she also left a couple of years ago. But while my mom, my little brother, and, and I were in the religious cult, it was all-consuming and dictated all my feelings, my worldview, and my decisions. By the way, that's abuse if you can't come up with those yourself at any age. Looking back, I can now see that I wasn't allowed to really be a kid or teenager. I loved school, but college was out of the question because higher education was deeply frowned upon. Okay, I think I know what religious cult you're talking about. Um, not allowing education is abuse. Armageddon or the end of the world was a constant dark cloud and I felt like God was watching everything I did and any wrong decision I made could warrant my execution. I wasn't allowed to have any friends who weren't in the cult. Judgmentalism, gossip culture, staying very busy in cult culture, and fear of God's wrath were my normal growing up. No holidays, birthdays, celebrations, school sports, or extracurricular activities were allowed. I felt like an outsider, and the only place I felt belonging to, where, where I felt I belonged, was in the church. <sighs> okay, I'm going to say it again. It's abuse. It's abuse. I'm not anti-religion, but a religion that um, tries to convince you that you're about to die in the end of, wor of the world, or an ideology. Judgmentalism. That stuff, that's just kind of negative culture, but this thing where you are put in fear and not allowed to have extracurricular activities is abuse. The list of sins that could get you exterminated forever is very long in that cult. Premarital sex is at the top of the list. Exterminated. Exterminated. Wow, what a word. Is that the word they use, I wonder? I don't know. But I know what you mean. Um, I thought nobody would ever want me. When I was 19... I met a guy online, the AOL days, LOL, she says, and we became friends. He was also in the cult, but not born into it. 
Dating outside the cult is strictly forbidden. We were friends for a couple years. I didn't think he liked me romantically. We communicated long distance and looked back and I can now see that my imagination created a whole fairy tale story about him. I guess it was limerence. I lost a ton of weight and we met up and I realized that I had had a crush on him the entire time and we started dating. Dating was only allowed with the goal of marriage and things moved very quickly, too quickly. One evening we were making out and things escalated and stopped being consensual for me. And you say, I felt so guilty like I had committed the unforgivable sin and the only way to make things right was to get married. That is trauma-driven thinking. I mean, you know, it's YouTube. I'm not even going to say the word for what that was, but you know what it is when it wasn't consensual for you and it's not what you wanted and it happened. You know what that is. And because you were so brainwashed by this whole culty thing, you thought the only way to make things right was to get married. We're going to talk about making things right. Hold on. Because of course there are alternatives to getting married. Another important thing to mention is that in this religious cult, a person who commits a sin like we did is required to make a confession to a committee of three men who are in leadership of the congregation. The three men asked me extremely detailed questions about the non-consensual experience. It was so traumatizing. My fiance and I were expelled out of the community and completely shunned by everybody for two years until we begged our way back into the cult. We got married at the courthouse. My mother didn't attend. It was all so depressing and scary. Oh, so sorry. Needless to say, this was a rocky start for a marriage. Mm -hmm. I also want to come back to when this non-consensual event happened that you felt so guilty. The marriage hasn't been easy. I became just like my mother, screaming, angry, and struggling with episodes of very dark depression that would leave me paralyzed in bed for weeks and sometimes months. Abuse plus self-suppression equal depression. Not all depression, but what you're describing there is a very classic pattern. Um, my husband is more avoidant. He would abandon me and walk out of the room when I would try to communicate my frustrations and feelings. He has threatened to leave me multiple times and has even called our marriage a waste of life. When he, uh, if this wasn't the backstory that I already knew and this was like some sort of otherwise good marriage, I would be like, oh, that sounds, sometimes we say very harsh things in an argument, but in the context of things, that strikes me as just like, no way. And when he, this is not good. <laughs> when he did try to move out, my abandonment melange would kick in big time. Of course you had abandonment melange. A huge nervous system reaction to people leaving after getting kicked out of your family and your community and constantly living in fear that that was about to happen and not having an opportunity to establish yourself in the regular old world where we all must function. It would kick in. But I didn't have the language to describe those feelings of sheer terror or being alone. I know. It's so good we have a name for it now, isn't it? That feeling that comes up. It's good if you can just say, this is abandonment melange. And it helps to bring down that sort of frantic, um, desperate need to get out of the emotion at any cost, even going back to the abuser. I would grovel and beg him to stay. We've done multiple sessions of therapy with various therapists. We don't have kids. I wanted to adopt because I couldn't have my own biological children, but my husband refused to consider this. I wasn't the perfect wife either. My short temper and raising my voice pushed him away and showing physical affection has been very difficult for me. I frequently have flashbacks of my first sexual experience with him and I can't get it out of my head. And at the same time, I feel so stupid for marrying a person who could do that. I've also had a couple emotional affairs, which I'm not proud of. Oh dear. My dear, my dear. That can happen to people in the best of times. But when you're just like completely abandoned emotionally and nobody cares about you, it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. You have a natural need for love and it's gonna find a way like a dandelion in a crack in the sidewalk. So as you say, after I woke up and realized I was in a high control organization and I had been brainwashed, I started doing tons of research about topics like cult mind control, narcissism, and borderline personality disorder. 
and you say, I was diagnosed in 2003 with borderline, but I now think it's just CPTSD. You may very well be right. There's quite a, quite a few voices in the mental health field who think that borderline personality is either overdiagnosed or imagined, uh, you know, a diagnosis that's slapped on almost always women who are very upset and traumatized. So we don't know. It, here, we don't worry too much about diagnosis because I'm not a diagnostician. We, we notice what symptoms do I have and what do I need to, to change in my life so that I can begin to be happy. That's what you need to worry about. So whatever the diagnosis is. My angry outbursts calmed down and I began to show compassion to myself because I grew up in such isolation. You were telling the truth to yourself about the brainwash and the cult. And look how that calmed down the anger. So that's what happens when we're lying to ourselves. But still, so you said I had to make all new friends because my former religious community, including my brother, all shun me. They won't even say hello in public. I'm so sorry. That's just evil. That's, I'm so sorry. Here's where I feel stuck. I still believe marriage is sacred. Oh, you know, when it's actually a marriage. Marriage is something that by definition must have two consenting adults. And how can a person in a state of abuse and brainwashing be considered to have actually consented to marriage? when there was all that pressure, that you had now done something wrong because you were assaulted and you had to fix it by getting married. That's not consent, that's terror. And I'm so sorry. So, you know, many faiths do make the distinction between a marriage that was coerced because of high pressure of some situation, of a pregnancy or citizenship, or, you know, fear of violence and a marriage that was freely chosen, freely chosen by two parties mature and aware enough to make a free choice. And I, I you know, I, I'm just gonna tell you, I don't see you as somebody who had that yet. Marriage would be sacred, but a marriage is also between people who can show up in love. I give you my permission for what it's worth to you. I give you my permission to leave. I know it takes work, you say, like a garden. Yeah, that's like rhetoric for people who are in functional marriages that don't involve rape. But has the pendulum swung to the opposite extreme, where people are too quick to discard their partner and avoid doing the hard work and start over with somebody new? Yes, I think they have, but I don't think that phenomenon applies to you. I don't think you're being too quick. I think you're miserable. You're going through clinical depression, even beginning to be honest about the brainwashing and you know mind control. That I don't hear that you ever really had a chance to recover from that in your life choices. He said, I've done so much therapy, read self-help books, listened to podcasts, read relationship books. You attend 12-step meetings and you've put effort into creating a joyful life. But I still feel so much loneliness in my marriage. So I would call that due diligence. You've done what a person can do to try to save the day. The volatility in my marriage has become replaced with monotony. We are roommates. I can see how that happens. I can see how that happens. Like it's so much easier to just like shut down your feelings, your needs, your thoughts, anything that you would like to chat about your day, shut it down. It's just going to lead to trouble. So that's not, that's not even companionship. It's certainly not love. Uh, we pay the bills, go to work and spend Sundays on the couch, watching too much TV and eating crappy food. Sounds like two depressed people. Could it be possible that sometimes there's just too much past trauma to overcome and walking away is the best option? Yes, that was a very bold move to marry the guy who had sexually assaulted you. That was a, it was a radical experiment that you probably weren't in the best position to undertake. But you've gotten your answer. This is, this is horrible. And it, too much trauma has happened. My brain replays the hurt, the years of hurt, neglect, violence. Okay, violence. You know, what interests me is how hard it is sometimes for people to name, to recognize violent treatment of them as a child. And yeah, and this was from, this is your pattern. This was in your childhood. Well, I went to school with bruises, the police were called. There was violence, but I wasn't abused. And you're just saying, you know, is there too much trauma, but you're sick of the violence. It's like the trauma is never ending, girl. It's never ending. And you know, it's a hard fact that it's pretty hard for people to actually like heal and become their true and real selves when they're threatened with violence in their own home. So, 
you have a choice, you know, you have a choice. And it's so important that you make your own choice about this. Not pressured by me. There's people in the comments who are going to say, run, run, I know. But it's your choice. It's your choice. And um, I would just say what some people do in a situation where they're ambivalent is they have a separation. And you can just experience a little bit for six months or something. What are you like? What are you like when you do your own thing? And I would imagine if he's this hurtful, neglectful, violent, apathetic, avoidant, uh, he's not going to take it well and he'll make your life miserable. And I hope that just makes it even clearer if he can't allow you to do this after all you've been through. You say you have a mismatched love language style and I don't know how to relate to my husband as a wife. What does a couple do when the storms have passed and they're in the doldrums? My married life feels like a boring version of ground, Groundhog Day. I now enjoy holidays and birthdays, things that were strictly forbidden in the cult, and self-expression like tattoos. But my husband still hates all these things, even though he no longer participates in our former group. How do two people build bridges after the storm washes the old dysfunctional ones away? I feel like I'm terminally stuck in indecision. Please help. All right. Indecision and confusion, I notice, are often um, kind of like, it's, it's, it's like the smoke that comes out of the fire of, of denial. And when we're in denial, we keep going, I don't know, I'm confused. Is this so bad? The, the, when you say it's boring and it's shut down and you're just doing a routine, I remember this. I, I was in an emotionally abusive relationship in the past. And for a long time, it was really awful. And um, I was called names and threatened with abandonment every day. And it really sucked in my trauma brain to just want to hold on and not, not let it end. And um, when it ended, when he left, <laughs> I, I realized how shut down I was. I didn't know how to talk to people. All my friendships were shallow and fake because I couldn't tell anybody what was really going on at home. I don't know if you tell your friends or if you feel like your friendships are deep and real, but I just wouldn't tell anybody what was going on. I had a deep need to compensate for how ashamed I was of being in that relationship by acting like I'm so cool, I've got it all together. I try not to do that. I often will talk openly, like on my calls, my, my daily practice calls and um, with members and things, or in my live workshops, I talk about, you know, I'll just tell you, this is one of the things that I'm still messed up about. So I just talk about that openly. I don't want to ever turn into that person again who wants to look like I have it all together as if there's anything to be gained by that, that matters, <laughs> that matters. So if you're shut down, I, I'm just guessing some things that would be helpful for you are movement, being outside, being with friends, telling the truth, finding a safe environment to tell the truth. Like when you went to 12 step programs, did you talk for real about what was going on? Did you get a sponsor? I'm not accusing you. I'm just saying I've done 12 step kind of half-assed and I've done it all the way and you get very different results. So if you're still confused, if you're doing um, any kind of 12 step program of recovery, uh, it could be like you haven't really come in and sat all the way down. Something Susan Pierce Thompson talks about, come in, sit all the way down, meaning participate in everything, get the sponsor talk, share every meeting, talk to people, put up chairs, participate. And with therapists, you know, you mentioned this and I'm just sort of curious, like, did they catch this or were they, were they part of the cults? I'm curious about what kind of feedback you got. I don't, I don't have a chance to talk to you about that, to just say, well, didn't they call it? Did anybody condone this? Were people pressuring you to leave? So I can just see that little, that little brainwashing piece well, it's not brainwashing. Marriage is sacred. But my gut feeling, my gut feeling is that this is what you're using to avoid abandonment, Melange. That you have begged him to come back in the past. And the feeling of leaving him when you anticipate it is so terrible that you'd rather live a life of quiet desperation than deal with the feelings that are going to come up when you go. And I totally understand. And when, when the fear of that abandonment stuff coming up, because for anybody who doesn't have it or doesn't know there's a name for it, people who have been genuinely abandoned in childhood are often prone to this. And um, Pete Walker, he came up with the term abandonment melange. It's a very intense set of feelings of like terror, panic, rage that come up. 
not only at the end of the relationship, but at the thought of the end of the relationship, it comes up and it's so, it just makes you want to die. It feels so bad and you think you can't get through it. But I'm going to give you your first tip for this. When you know what abandonment melange is, you give it a name. And when it's happening, you say, this is abandonment melange. The next thing is you need to be associating with people who know what abandonment melange is and can help talk you through it. It's almost like if you were hanging out with a friend who had taken too much LSD or something and they're freaking out. I've never done that. <laughs> they're freak your friend is freaking out and you're trying to say, it's okay, we're in the room, there are no monsters. Like we need other people who honestly know what's going on to help us stay grounded in reality that you're not about to die, that you're actually capable of having a place to live and having friends and being safe from him. Even if it were, I don't know if it's at that point, but women's shelters, this is this extraordinary thing that exists. If you fear that he will get violent at you for leaving or he harasses you, there is support for that. And I totally understand if you don't want to let it go that far, but that's not, not wanting it to go that far is not a good reason to live your life of quiet desperation and shutting yourself down and demanding nothing and feeling alone in your own house. That's terrible. Being, uh, being alone in your own house when you actually are in solitude, it doesn't have that terrible, hurtful feeling to it. It might be lonely sometimes, but it sounds like you're quite capable of making friends. I'm so proud of you for doing these things and seeking help. You're sure not alone that you're that you're you're in a in a toxic relationship. Boy, do we do that with CPTSD. And, you know, if you choose, come into my programs. We ha I have a free course, the daily practice. You could try that. See if it appeals to you. I have other courses, too. You can check them out. I've always got links down in the description section. I can tell you that in, in uh, the people who come into my membership program, we have this huge and wonderful online community, very vibrant very, um, you know, active people talk and share and, and we have multiple daily calls where people use the techniques together and connect and talk about how their day is going. And it's lovely. And everybody here has trauma, everybody, and everybody here is working on healing it. And they're following common principles. They're not here talking about, Oh, it's so terrible. It's so terrible. They're talking. I mean, it was terrible. And sometimes that comes up but we're talking about here's how I'm managing my symptoms today. Here's how I'm holding my boundaries today. Here's how I'm, what I'm planning to do to make a decision in due time, but not immediately. And the group can help you do that. So one way to just put your toe in and find out about us is to take the free course. And if you take it, you'll get invited to free calls with me or members of my coaching team. We have them every week. So the calls are free, the course is free, and it's a common way that people can get together and start connecting and healing together. And you can get a feel like, is this, is this a place you want to hang out for a bit? And if so, you could come, come in. But whatever you do, I, I just want to give you just some love and invite the commenters to send you some love and encouragement and um, try everybody not to give advice about everything. When people are in a dilemma, unsolicited advice feels hard. But, um, you know, just share your own experience of how you dealt with something like this. If you can be kind and, um, and, and, and see, if you, see if you can kind of increase the level of connection that the people who relate to this story feel to our community on YouTube. That's how, that's a big piece. I hear this from people all the time. Oh, I like the content, but I really like the community. That's just the people who comment. It's pretty cool. So thank you to all of you who support other people and share openly about what's going on. There is a lot of love here and it is online. I know it's not the same as people in your, in your present day life, but uh, some, some members in my program who live in a European country um, are meeting in person for the first time and they sent pictures, they're hanging out, they're going on a road trip. And I was, I just couldn't be happier. And they do the daily practice together. They have a common language for how to work on healing. Like this is, this is good stuff to have friends who are also walking a path of healing with you and tools that you can use to get through those times when your abandonment is trying to suck you back into the miserable old pattern that you grew up with. So we want better for you. <laughs> we want better for you, Ashley. 
Anybody who wants to take my daily practice and check it out, you'll find it right here. Click on it and you can start right away. It takes less than an hour to learn it. And I will see all of you very soon.